Hello everyone and welcome back to Beatly Tones Beatles channel. Lovely to have you here. Thanks for joining me for this video and I hope you're all doing well. If you've seen this channel for the first time, it's not a welcome back, it's just a welcome. Uh, so thank you for joining me. In today's video, I'm going to be doing uh, one of my deep dive reviews, part of the deep dive review series that I've been doing. Um, and I'm going to be looking at this album from 1972, sometime in New York City, by uh, John and Yoko. Um, I've, I've picked this album because um, I've been kind of been inspired uh, to talk about it by uh, my good friend Larry Graves, the Canadian stud muffin who were on his channel uh, the other day. He had a guest on and they discussed this album. So I thought I would like to put my you know, my two pence worth in about this album. Um, if you haven't seen these deep dive review videos before, what I do is um, we talk about each track on the album. We give it a score out of 10. We add up all the score uh, for the whole album uh, to get a total for the album, divide it by the number of tracks to get an average score for the album. And then what we do is we plonk it into uh, Beatly Tones' great big album review uh, table, which looks at the moment like this. And see how it compares against the albums of Paul, uh, George, Ringo, and indeed the Beatles themselves. Because I think everybody needs to know whether, uh, you know, whether Extra Texture is a better album than Ringo the Fourth. Now, um, I think that before we get into talking about sometime in New York City, which, uh, let's be honest, um, is a very uh, difficult album. It's uh, a much maligned album, an album that was described at the time uh, that it came out as being the worst album uh, by a mainstream artist ever, uh, which of course is absolute nonsense, but it is a difficult album. But is it as bad as, you know, it's it, it, is it as bad as it's painted to be? Uh, that's what the idea of doing this review is. And, um, you know, I think to, you know, to work that out, you've kind of got to put the album into, uh, to, into context. So 1972, there's a lot going on uh, in the world uh, for John to be unhappy about. He has just moved um, to New York City. In September 1971, he moved to New York City. Um, the reason that they moved is um, because uh, Yoko was trying to track down her, her daughter, Kyoko, who was being, you know, um, taken from pillar to post by her uh, her previous husband, Tony Cox. And uh, so she was trying to, to find her daughter. Now, they moved, they moved from the luxury... Um, of Tittenhurst Park to, um, I wouldn't say it was squalor, no, far, far from it, but they, they moved to a modest apartment uh, in Bank Street in Greenwich Village, uh, but nowhere near as salubrious as the uh, surroundings of Tittenhurst Park. So John was kind of, um, you know, I think he was out of his comfort zone. Let's say he was out of his comfort zone he was also pounced upon by um sort of two sort of left-wing activists uh abby hoffman and jerry rubin who were sort of famous for um kind of political theater which was right up john street because john you know john and yoko performed their own uh you know brand of political theatre you know things like the bedding for peace was a piece of political theatre the you know the plant in the acres all that sort of stuff the bagism all this sort of all these sort of um you know uh you know humorous sort of stunts that john and yoko did in the name of the peace is kind of the same thing as you know rubin and hoffman were doing um but whereas um you know john and yoko did it with humor um you know, Hoffman and Rubin were very, very, very serious. And they pounced on John and Yoko and kind of used them um, for their own ends, I think, um, you know, in some ways. And um, the outcome of that uh, didn't always work. And uh, we're going to we're going to kind of go into the, 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 you know, the individual songs and the topics and that and that sort of thing. Um, first thing I'd like to do is just uh, always like to um to show the actual album so this is the um the album this is the only version of the album that i own 
on, um, on on vinyl. Now I got this in 1977 um, for my 16th birthday, uh, when my parents said, "You know, what do you want for your birthday?" And I said, uh, "Records." And um, I had to 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 get these records. I had to suffer the indignity of going around a record shop with my dad, uh, which was you know was not good for either of our credibilities, to be fair. And he sort of said, "You, you know." Go and pick what you want and I'll tell you when to stop. I kind of thought I was being clever because I picked albums that were doubles or treble albums because I thought they would be difficult for me to save for on my own with my pocket money. So I went for things like All Things Was Past Concert for Bangladesh and uh, Sometime in New York City, which uh, is a kind of double album um, and in some ways it's not. Um, you know, there is a studio album here uh, but it, there is also a second disc, which is a live album. And it's kind of from two different live performances. One in 1969 um, and one in 1971 with Frank Zappa and uh, the Mothers. And I'll talk about those in a minute. But the live performances aren't really connected to each other. And they're not really connected to the studio album either. It's kind of like a bonus disc. But, um, you know, it was priced like a double album. So, uh that was why I went for it. So um, it does have a gatefold sleeve, which looks like that. And um, I just uh, I just talk about this because for an album that doesn't really have any humour uh, whatsoever, um, there is a bit of humour added um, around this um, uh, this 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 photo here. So this is a photo, obviously, of John and Yoko with. Uh, the elephant's memory band and in the um in the on the inner sleeve here it 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 gives a you know uh it tells you who is who in that in that photograph and it's got front row second row third row and back row now if you look at the photo uh, there there is only three rows really of people and uh it says for the back row it's the uh, invisible strings which is brilliant because you can't see them because they're invisible. It's like the best joke on the whole album. In fact, it's the only joke on the whole album. Um, the rest of the, the gatefold, this picture here of John and Yoko with, uh, playing with Frank Zappa at the Fillmore East in 1971. And these two here are taken from the Lyceum Ballroom um, in 1969, where they had a whole host of uh, stars playing with them. Delaney and Bonnie, George Harrison, um, Keith Moon, Klaus Vorman, um, and I think Eric Clapton as well. Uh, lot, lot, you know, lots of lots of big names. They only did um, two songs, and I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the the sleeve is designed like a like a newspaper, um, you know, telling the stories of the day, which is a very clever idea, or it would have been a clever idea had it not been done. Um, by Jethro Tull, probably about six months previously, um, for their album Thick, Thick as a Brick. Um, but it's kind of um, it's kind of ironic that you know, sort of, you know, you know, we have this 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 expression here uh, in the UK of you know today's headlines, tomorrow's fish and chip paper, and in 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 some ways that is very true about this album because you know some of the uh, some of the songs on this album uh, or the or the causes that are being um you know lauded within the songs uh, were done and dusted by the time the album came out uh, they they were finished for example um we've got the, the there's the, there's the song about uh, John Sinclair on here who was kind of busted um got 10 years uh, imprisonment for owning uh, two marijuana joints. Now, by the time this album came out, uh, you know John Sinclair was re was released. So that's what I kind of mean by, you know, it's you know it's it's today's uh, you know today's headlines, tomorrow's fish and chip paper. Now the um, the inner sleeve of the main album looks like that, uh, which has got basically the the cast of musicians on it and the songs of both the the main studio album and uh, the live jam album um, the vinyl for that uh, looks like this uh, um, that is side one 
and uh, that is side two. It's got this uh, custom label, uh, which is very clever, where um, you know the, the 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 picture of John sort of morphs into uh, a picture of Yoko. Uh, I think that was done by Ian McMillan, who took the photo for the Abbey Road uh, cover. Now, my original album came with a postcard, uh, which was a picture of the Statue of Liberty with a sort of a clenched fist and. Um, I don't have that anymore because I think I put it up on my bedroom wall when I was a kid and it's obviously got lost in the midst of time. Now, I think original copies of the American version of this album came also with a poster which had a picture of a soldier with Fit to Die uh, written on it. I'm not 100% sure on that because I've never actually seen it. Maybe uh, some American viewers can uh, confirm that or deny it. Uh, please let me know down in the comments. The um, the live jam disc kind of the inner sleeve looks like this, um, and this is um, basically uh, John has kind of defaced uh, the Frank Zappa uh, live at the Fillmore East cover and you know added some doodles to it or or some extra information. Now uh, you say there's two there's two concerts, one from the Lyceum Ballroom 1969 uh, where they did two songs, Cold Turkey and um, Yoko's. Uh, don't worry, Kyoko, mummy's only looking for a hand in the snow, whatever that means. And then the um, uh, the the other one from the with the mother's invention. Uh, uh, there's four tracks uh, that they did with uh, the mother's in invention. Well, baby, baby, please don't go, which is a decent track. Um, and then tracks called uh, Jam Jam Rag Scumbag and O, oh, um, which you know are if you kind of listen to the you know to what's being played uh you know the mother's invention are trying their best but unfortunately uh what what they're doing is being you know overlaid by yoko uh screaming and shouting and barking like a dog now if you know if you, you know if you're familiar with my channel you'll know that i am a big supporter of yoko when she is doing proper songs uh when she's doing the you know the screaming and the shouting and the barking and the whole thing with the sort of multi-tracked voice where it's just relentless you know yelping um over music i'm not i'm not digging that at all um so that is the album so let's just let's let's go and talk about uh the, the tracks on the studio album. So Sometime in New York City was released in June 1972 in the US. In the UK, we had to wait another three months uh, for the album. It didn't come out until September 1972. And that was because there was a dispute with Northern Songs uh, that some of the so songs on the album, in fact, six of them, were credited to uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. It's interesting, actually, that we kind of think of this as a John Lennon solo album, um, but only two tracks on this album were written solely by Lennon, that's uh, New York City and uh, John Sinclair. Uh, there are two songs credited uh, just to Yoko, which are Sisters, Oh Sisters and We're All Water. The rest are Lennon, Ono joint compositions. Now, uh, for the backing musicians on this album, uh, John used Elephant's Memory Band and uh, uh, a New York based left wing uh, band, pretty much unknown. They were introduced to John by uh, their friend and drummer, Jim Keltner. And uh, let's be honest, they are not the best band uh, to be, to be fair as I say, they were, they were literally unknown. And, um, you know, if you listen to uh, the album, you know, John Lennon live in New York City, you'll hear uh, mistakes galore uh, during that, that, that gig performance. And, um, it, you know, it was kind of a lesson learned for uh, for John uh, because, you know, he, you know, be, the album before on Imagine, you know, he'd used top musicians, um, you, you, um, you know, Alan White and Nicky Hopkins and George Harrison and, you know, a lot of Klaus Vormann. And from that point going forward, he only ever used uh, crack musicians on on the rest of uh, his, you know his his albums, and uh, so it was a you know a mistake learned. The other you know the other thing about this album is the production uh, from Phil Spector. Uh, it's, it's it's credited as joint as John Yoko and Phil Spector, but this is the, the Phil Spector sound, and uh, it's terrible basically. Uh, very very muddy, and could really do with a proper remix. Uh, more of that later. Okay, so the opening song 
on the album. A woman is the you know what of the world. I'm not going to say is the end of the world because that just sounds a little bit lame. I'm going to say woman is the figure of the world so it can at least sound similar. Now obviously that word even in 1972 uh, was not uh, acceptable but but you would hear it on TV uh, you know fairly regularly. Uh, John went on the Dick Cavett show. Uh, he did a lot of TV uh, promotion for some time in New York City. Um, um, and he, you know, he went to great lengths to explain that that word just doesn't necessarily uh, apply to, you know, to black people, um, but it applies to anyone that is oppressed. Um, and uh, that is the true meaning of the word. And, it, you know, it's funny because, you know, in today's society, um, you know, we've got, you know, rap music or hip hop or flip flop or trip hop or plip plop or whatever it's called uh, these days, which use that word in abundance, you know, it, you know, all the, all the time. And, you know, it, no one really thinks anything of it. Um, but, you know, it is a an offensive word. And, uh, bec you know, because of that, um, you know, this track, which was released as a single in the US, didn't get very much airplay. It didn't even get a release as a single in the UK. But as a track, as an opening track, you know, um, I think it's a really strong opening song. You know, obviously a song about feminism, um, you know, in 1972, uh, this was a big uh, thing with the women's liberation um, movement sort of gathering pace and stuff like that and for you know an alpha male like John Lennon to sort of stand up and say well this is my take on it um, was was quite brave now the lyrics throughout this album are really really questionable um, but I think on this on this track it kind of all pretty much um, get, you know gets it right uh, you know woman is the figure of the world yes she is think about it um, you know, woman is the fear of the world. Uh, think about it and do something about it. And it goes on to, you know, to say all these things of, of how women are, are, are treated. Now, the, the, the song is quite strong musically. Um, Stan Bronstein from um, Elephant's Memory Band on saxophone. And this is a very sax heavy uh, song. Now, normally I don't like a lone saxophone i like a horn section but a lone saxophone could quite often just sound like a fart um to my ears um but on this song it it does sound really good uh i do think this is a really strong opening track um it's a song that i like it's one of the best on the album and i'm going to give this eight out of ten which is a strong opener so track two on the album is the reggae tinged uh sisters oh sisters written and sung uh, by Yoko. She does a good job um, with this song. Now, reggae uh, was starting to influence John and Yoko. It, it is starting to gather momentum in the UK um, around this time. If it hadn't quite sort of hit home yet in the US, but in the, in the UK it had. So that is the influence there. This is not quite uh, reggae because it's in 4-4 time, um, but it's reggae tinged definitely and it's got a reggae feel to it um it's a really catchy song actually and you kind of get the feeling that if it had been sung maybe by uh you know someone other than yoko this could have actually been a, a you know a hit single um but um you know another song about uh empowering women women's liberation and uh, freedom for women that sort of thing i think this is a good song i'm giving it six and a half out of ten now the next song attica state this is a song about uh the prison riots at attica state uh, prison where uh, 43 uh, people, uh, some most mostly prisoners, but some prison guards as well, were all killed uh, in the riots. And it's really difficult to get behind this song when you think about, you know, some of the crimes uh, that some of these, you know, rapists, murderers, um, those sort of, uh, you know, hideous crimes. It's hard to get behind lyrics that say things like, you know, free the prisoners, jail the judges free all prisoners everywhere. Uh, and when you think about the irony of that, um, the man who took John Lennon's life uh, spent the thir first 31 years of his prison sentence in Attica State. Uh, let's hope they didn't improve the conditions in the prison uh, that much. A very difficult song um, to get behind, but it is a kind of a rocker, it is upbeat. Um, it's not bad musically, but lyrically, 
it's terrible and as I say it's hard to get behind so I'm just going to give this one five out of ten the next song born in a prison another song written by Yoko uh, she sings this quite well but it's a very depressing song um, uh, where you know she's she you know she's using the uh, the comparison of life in general uh, as being you know like a prison we're born in a prison raised in a prison sent to a prison called school well you know school can be unpleasant um for some people but it's not really it's not really a prison um you know the the, the lyrics to this are quite are quite depressing it's quite a depressing take on life um the refrain on it which is uh, nicely harmonized um by john um is kind of half upbeat and half not. Um, wood becomes a flute uh, when it's love. Reach for yourself and your battered mates. That's a little bit, you know, upbeat. But then it goes on. Mirror becomes a razor when it's broken. Look in the mirror and see your shattered fate. Uh, you know, very depressing stuff. Um, there's one verse that just really gets me. Um, I just think it's just a terrible lyric. Um, we live with no reason, kicked around with no reason, thrown out. Uh, without reason, like tools, like tools, like a hammer, like a screwdriver. Is that, is that the best analogy uh, that Yoko could come up with uh, for that song? Um, as I say, it's not a bad song, but it's a depressing song. I'm giving it five and a half out of ten. Side two ends with an absolute belter, an out and out rocker, uh, kind of in the style of Chuck Berry. Uh, this song could be uh could be called a kind of a son of or a little brother to uh the ballad of johnny yoko because it's very similar uh in its storytelling way uh this one tells the story of johnny yoko's arrival in new york standing on the corner just me and yoko okay, i know we're waiting for jerry to land jerry rubin of course up come a man with a guitar in his hand singing have a marijuana if you can it kind of goes on uh to you know, to talk about, you know, meeting up with Ele Elephant's memory and making music with them, um, you know, go going to the Fillmore, um, playing with uh, Frank Zappa. Um, you know, this is not, a, this is a song that isn't without a little bit of humour, um, I suppose, but it is an out and out rocker. I think it's one of the best songs on the album. Um, I'm going to give this one eight out of 10. So side two opens with the song Sunday Bloody Sunday. Now this is the song about um, something that happened in, in Northern Ireland on the 30th of January 1972, where 13 civilians who were on a march uh, were shot down uh, by the British Army. A uh, terrible, terrible tra uh, tragedy. Um, but, and, um, you know, the, the, this song musically is, is pretty good. It's pretty good. It starts off with a kind of a, you know, a drum beat, which kind of, you know, like a military drum, uh, which kind of, you know, emulates the the the, the march, I guess, I guess. Um, and, um, you know, the song is a rocker. It's got, a, you know, it's got a, a, a you know, um, it's got a pretty good guitar solo in the middle. It's got a pretty good sax solo as well. But it's got terrible, terrible lyrics. And, um you know, John sort of talked about this. He he said this, you know, this, this, you know, I'm sitting in New York. This happens in Northern Ireland and I react to it in 4-4 time with a guitar solo in the middle, which is kind of um, exactly, exactly what he, what he's done. And, he, you know, he he kind of says that with regret and uh, retro, retrospectively with re regret. Um, but this song, you know, I think is badly thought out, badly thought through. Um, the lyrics here are terrible. They kind of, they sympathise with the IRA who are, are a, a terrorist organisation and, you know, who who planted bombs in, the, you know, in the UK and other places throughout the late 60s and throughout the 70s and killed lots of innocent people um, in the same way. And it's interesting that this one event um, prompted both John Lennon and Paul McCartney uh, to write songs about it. Paul's song, um, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, is a much milder uh, take on this same uh, event where, you know, Paul doesn't really know where he's going with it. You know, he, you know, on one hand, he's singing, you know, um, you know, Great Britain, you are tremendous. And on the other hand, he's saying, get out of, uh, get out of Ireland. And, um, you know, uh, 
you know, when we look at the lyrics of, you know, of, of, of this, this song, um, you know, it is terrible. Things like, you Anglo pigs and Scottish sent to colonise the North. You wave your bloody Union Jacks and you know what it's worth. How dare you hold to, to ransom a people proud and free. Keep Ireland for the Irish. Put the, put the English back to sea. Uh, the chorus, uh, Sunday, bloody Sunday, uh, bloody Sunday is the way, is out of Yoko's vocal range and sounds terrible. Um, it doesn't you know, add anything to the song at all. Uh, John and Yoko singing together um, on this song doesn't really work. Uh, it, well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. Um, this song has got a kind of a fade out and a fade in, just like, you know, Strawberry Fields and Helter Skelter. But when this one fades back in, um, it just prolongs the agony. I feel, I think it's, a, as I say, it's a, you know, musically, it's not a bad song. Lyrically, it's terribly, it's terribly thought out. Um, and uh, a song I think that, that John would have regretted, uh, well, he did regret in, in later times. I'm giving it a uh, five out of 10. And I think that is generous. The next song, um, The Luck of the Irish, is the most bizarre song on this album i think it's a content well it is it is the worst song on the album as far as i'm concerned again uh sympathizes with the ira which have, would have not gone down well in the uk um at the time but it is bizarre uh because for a start you know it has got the most prettiest melody of any song on this album a uh, really really lovely me uh, melody but the words are uh so vicious uh, so vicious, um, you know, things like, you know, um, you know, if you had the luck of the Irish, you'd be sorry and wish you were dead. If you had the luck of the Irish, you'd wish you were English instead. And things like, um, why the hell are the English there anyway, as they kill with God on their side, blaming all on the kids and the IRA as the bastards commit genocide, I, I genocide. And this is, you know, very vicious lyrics. And then Yoko's verses, uh, which are interspersed between John's verses, um, are absolutely bizarre. Uh, she uses all this, this flowery uh, language, which kind of, you know, neutralises the viciousness of John's lyrics. You know, if we could make chains with the morning dew, the world would be like Galway Bay. Let's walk over rainbows like leprechauns. And the world would be one big Barney, Blarney stone. That is nuts. That's absolutely fucking nuts. Uh, lyrics uh, in this in this song. You're going from one extreme to the other with this beautiful, beautiful melody in it. Yoko doesn't sing her verses well either um, on this song. Um, uh, I think this is the worst song on the album. I'm giving it three out of ten and I am being generous with that. Track three on side two is John Sinclair. The story of John Sinclair, who was a, you know, a left wing radical uh, guy. Uh, he, he got uh, 10 years prison for uh, slipping two uh, joints of marijuana to an undercover uh, policeman woman, which was absolutely ridiculous. 10 years uh, for two joints. Uh, there was a rally at Anna Bore in Michigan, uh, uh, which John turned up for, played a few songs and, uh, the next day or the day after that, uh, John Sinclair was uh, released from prison, uh, which, you know, which is great. And John must have been really happy uh, about that. And it does show that, you know, the value of protesting when it is put, uh, you know, in, to the right, right decision. But if we've got to, 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 got to have the word got to used 15 times in every uh, verse. It's really annoying, isn't it? It's really annoying. Um, but, you know, some of the, the lyrics in here uh, uh, are much better and much more to the point. Uh, you know, was he jailed for what he'd done, representing everyone? Free John now, if we can, from the clutches of the man. Uh, let him free, lift the lid, bring him, bring him to his wife and kids. They gave him 10 for two. What else could the bastards do? Uh, you know, this is much better stuff. This is much better stuff. John Lennon plays a fantastic slide guitar on this song. Um, it's a it's a much more fun, lighthearted song. Um, I'm giving it seven and a half out of ten. The next song 
uh, Angela about uh, activist Angela Davis uh, song written by Yoko is absolutely beautiful. Um, it is her best song here on the album and I really, really, really love it. Uh, John sings great harmony as well on the on the choruses as well. And um, now this is where I'm going to talk about the the value of the of the remix because um, if you've got the Give Me Some Truth uh, compilation, this has got Angela, uh, a remix version of Angela on it, and it just sounds absolutely fantastic. And um, this is what we have kind of missed by not getting an ultimate mixes of um, of sometime in New York City uh, when we were promised it. You know, there was a website. We were told it was coming in 2022. And then all of a sudden the rug was pulled from underneath us and it was gone. It was off the table. Um, and, you know, Angela, the remix of Angela is just absolutely fantastic, done by Paul Hicks and Sean Lennon. And uh, it's a real shame. And that, that gives us a kind of example of what we've missed out on. But for this uh, for this album, I'm giving uh, Angela eight out of ten. The album's final track, Wear a Water, uh, written and sung by Yoko, um, is a, an upbeat rocker. Um, it goes on for seven minutes, uh, which is way, way too long. Uh, way, way too long. Um, you know, lyrics that kind of makes kind of make sense. Uh, there may not be much difference between Chairman Mao and Richard Nixon if you strip them naked. And uh, on the front of the cover, we've got that very, very uh, image. Uh, which you, once you've seen, you can't unsee. Um, but she goes on to make, you know, similar, um, similar comparisons of of things that, you know, don't make much sense. Um, don't really like the verse. Um, there may not be much difference between Manson, meaning Charles Manson, uh, and the Pope. If we press their smile, uh, that's a weird one. That's a weird one. Um, there may not be much difference between Rockefeller and you if we hear you sing. Well, there may not be, but then again, there could be. Uh, so we've never heard Rockefeller sing and she's never heard us sing. So how does she know? Um, I don't know. It's not a great track. Um, again, uh, lots of screaming and shouting uh, towards the end of this song. Um, there was um, there was a remix of uh, Sometime in New York City. I think this was done in... Um, 2005 and Paul Hicks was involved in the remix of this where where they kind of um they kind of chopped down uh, they kind of dumbed dumbed down sometime in New York City they knocked about a minute off of Sunday bloody Sunday they knocked about two minutes off of this one uh where or water and they cut out all the stuff from you know the or most of the stuff from the live jam the Frank Zappa um stuff uh where or water uh it's not a a favourite of mine. I can't really give it any more than four out of ten, which means that the to total for some time in New York City is sixty point five, um, which gives it an average of six point zero five. Uh, so let's go and take that and put it into uh, Beatly Tone's great big album ranking table and see where it comes. So out of the 12 albums that I've reviewed so far, uh, it's coming in at number 11, uh, just above Ringo Starr's I Want to Be Santa Claus and just below Please Please Me by The Beatles. So, um, you know, it's it, in summary, you know, it's a very difficult album, but I still feel that it's a really important album for John Lennon because it, you know, be, because that is where he was at at that particular time. And that is... Uh, that is that is really important that that is catalogued and uh, you know it's it's there in it's there in music so I do think it's an important album it's not his best album by a long shot and um, I don't think it's the worst album by a mainstream artist ever made uh, not by a long shot either um, but you know I think that as far as the ultimate mixes goes I really think that the uh, when we hear what um, Paul Hicks and Sean Lennon did with the song Angela, you know, it makes you wonder how and, ha uh, you know, what what a, re a proper remix could do for this album, because that, that version of Angela, that song, Give Me Some Truth, you know, br breathed new life into the song 
and it could do the same for the rest of the album. So it's a real shame that we're not getting an ultimate mixes of Sometime in New York City, uh, because as I say, it could change everyone's perception uh, to some extent, not completely, but to some extent of how good uh, this album is. And you know, when we think about how few John Lennon albums there are, um, we can't really afford to lose one, um, but you know, we can kind of understand that this is not a commercial album. It's not a popular album. It is really for die hard, for hard fans only. It's not going to have much appeal uh, to the general public. So you can kind of, from an economical point of view, you can understand why it was pulled. Um, but I just wish it, it hadn't really. Anyway, that is it from me. I would love to know what you think of Sometime in New York City. Please tell me about it down in the comments. You know that I do read all your comments and I will respond to all your comments. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye.